thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I'm really excited to chat to you today. Thanks for having me, Ben. Happy to be here. Cool. My pleasure. I'm actually firstly like really interested in your job and your role. So you're head of CX analytics at ServiceNow. What does that mean? Sure. And I can give you a little bit of, of background as well. So in essence, like how I like to speak about it is I'm a storyteller through data and a huge advocate for putting the customer at the center of every decision a company makes. So I've worked in customer experience management, both on the vendor side. So I started my CX career at Medallia, where I led the research team there that was focused on customer experience strategy. And Medallia is one of the, ca- the you know, category creators of customer experience management. And then I moved to the industry and really applying all of the best practices and sort of expertise of customer experience into the industry. So it's first at the B2C side with Eventbrite and now on the B2B side at ServiceNow. And what particularly I do at uh, ServiceNow as a customer experience analytics leader as part of the broader customer experience strategy team is ultimately um, really build a world-class experience management infrastructure where we listen to our customers, our partners, and our employees across key moments that matter on their journey with ServiceNow. So we enable a strong inner and outer loop closed loop process from following up with customers in real time when we hear their feedback to make sure we're solving issues in, in the moment or strengthening our relationships with our customer base to really equipping leadership in real time with actionable insights to make sure we're sending sending the right data to the right leader at the right time to make the right customer-centric mm-hmm. action that will drive improvements in the customer experience in our bottom line. And so mm-hmm. I usually talk about my role as you know 90% influence, 10% data. A lot of what we do is data and gathering that customer experience data, marrying it with operational and financial data and showing where customer experiences are great within their, the customer journey where they need improvement and what would that improvement do for us? Like how would it improve the customer experience and then how will that really drive loyalty and then success for service now? But a lot of what I do is influence. Like you need to go in and influence those leaders that these are the right decisions to be made, especially when there's many different, you know, initiatives in their docket uh, or sort of budget constraints or competing actions they could take. That's tough. Is service now is primarily like it's like a help desk, isn't it? Good question. No, it's way more than that. So <laughs> service now essentially is a platform form of platforms for the digital workflow revolution, right? So we provide a service model that automates the work uh, and streamlines and delivery of services. So it started with IT, and I think that's where we're getting the help desk. Like it really did start with IT service management where you would automate, you know, different IT tasks. Like I, I have an issue with this and it automatically goes to my IT team and it's resolved in real time and like all documented and it's great. But the company really has expanded way beyond that space. And now now is, is focused on employee and customer creator workflows, delivering experiences that break down silos and unlock all kinds of productivity. Like even now during the pandemic, we just came out with a vaccine administration management solution. So it, it is, it, we really are, when I talk about customer, also citizen centric, where you'd go in and like now, like with the vaccines being distributed, you, every company can easily see how many vaccines um, and appointments are there, notify patients about um, new vaccines that are available, communicate when a new segment of the population is being prioritized. So we've automated all, all of that as well. So it really is a lot more than and kind of help that. Oh, so it's not a help. So I, I think I got that from, I think I was talking to another, like a head of customer service. And I was like, what help desk do you use? And they were like, service now. Right. So like I, we, we have a customer service solution as well. It just, it, just it really good. is across the board. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So I, well, I was going to say, well, as a, as a help desk, you already know the value of customer experience. I still think that applies, but would you say you have more trouble or you have an easier job at influencing the organization to think about the customer? I know like a lot of people I talk to really struggle with that. It's like they get deprioritized and all of that kind of thing. Right. And like, that's also a good question. I think for a customer centric culture, first and foremost, and like for you really to drive any decisions around the customer, you need that top line or top executive support and uh, alignment, right? Like that culture starts at the top. And luckily enough, we have that at service now, right? Like our, our CEO, Bill McDermott is extremely customer centric and focused on the customer. We are 
a company that has a chief customer officer um, and partner officer actually, which my team rose up into. So it really follows the paradigm of customer experience is the battleground on which companies compete. If you think about 10 years ago, like customer, chief customer officer, that role did not exist, right? Like that it was, you know, CX would roll up into the CMO or services or uh, operations functions really not close to where decisions are being made. And like for CX to be successful, it needs to be placed and operate, even if it's on a centralized or a hybrid model, whatever the governance is within the company and what it works like for that specific business, it needs to be placed where decisions are being made. If it's a product-based company, it should be in product. If it is, if decisions are being made at the strategy level, it should be there. And we as a team are within the chief customer officer um, org. And so luckily, like we already have that sort of customer centric alignment there, but you still have to influence every global leader to make uh, a customer centered decision within their department. So it, 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 that's not enough. And so a lot um, of what my team does is really focusing on kind of aligning with global leaders of what are their business metrics that they care about and how can customer experience really drive and help improve those. So that's the, the way you influence is really aligning there. And one thing that I've seen that many companies or customer experience teams don't do or don't do soon enough is really showing the ROI of CX investments. First of all, why should we care about CX and how can we prove that with our own data? And that, you know, that is difficult to prove. Like you need to use customer experience data, marry it with operational and financial data and show just like, let's take net promoter score surveys that like, you know, I think most people know about, right? And like, and you have that rich data around who's a promoter, who's a passive, who's a detractor, like who's happy and who's happy. And how can you take that information um, and marry it with operational data and financial data in a model that shows promoters spend more, promoters are less costly to serve, promoters refer more and there's word of mouth and we grow faster, um, their revenue grows faster. And so you need to build that model, like using advanced analytics and then analytics team. That's what my team specializes in to show really at the top level, we care about CX. And then when we think about action and improvements, you need to build a business case for those. So if you take this action, what is, what is the ROI and how can we prove that by, by using data that we already have? Numbers a lot of times speak louder than words and you need to be able to, to do that across the board where many companies don't do that fast enough because they don't have the data or don't have the processes to marry the data in the organization because it's siloed, it's not in one place, like they don't have the right teams and analysts to do that with that type of experience and that's where they struggle. When I used to work for Medallia, my team, so the research team was really <clears throat> tasked with solving the most difficult problems that our customers have and really creating the category of customer experience. So the questions are that they had were first and foremost about ROI of CX. How can I as a team of CX prove that we should invest in customer experience and in my team and really get the CFO or the CF, CIO to get that investment and to put the customer first? That is the top question we have to answer. And like we provide consulting services where we would go in and like get their data, help them with building the model, teach them how to fish, you know, and how can they do this? That was the first and foremost. And like, if you don't do that, it, it is extremely hard to get any buy-in. Uh, but we would also answer questions around does employee experience matter for customer experience? And how, what is the relationship there? Like, how should a CX team be organized and governed? Or does omni-channel experiences matter and things like that? So it would solve problems like that, which has really helped me in my role at ServiceNow and before that at Eventbrite to, to build that type of expertise and like really use that know-how within ServiceNow in order to navigate and, and make decisions happen. I think speaking the, lang the language of the rest of the business, like actually talking about how do I impact bottom line growth is something that people miss a lot about customer experience. Like it's the hardest struggle when the business is like, okay, we want to grow and they, they can see acquisition of new customers is obvious, but like the retention side and the referrals and the word of mouth, all those things, all those things just mentioned is like the harder bit. Yeah. And really like tying it to customer experience, like isolating, because you could say like, oh, but we retain our customers in this type of segment because they, you know, they spend a lot with us. We have, you know, a good product. Uh, and so forth but like you need to like show really okay but outside of all of this and controlling for all of this like how what is the impact of customer experience yeah. so then there you could actually make an impact but speaking their language to your point because you can't go in and say oh you know uh, we'll improve NPS by this much if that's not already a critical metric for the company yeah. or if that's not something that leader is is accountable for because they, they have their export card and I'm like okay well this 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 is like what I need to deliver 
for this quarter. So how does, you know, any of those initiatives fit in that? And you have to, to get that linkage in, in order for any of those decisions to be made. And maybe someday, right after you build that, like customer experience in itself or the CX metrics in themselves, that is kind of the holy grail. They will matter most. And you already would know that they really impact cost to acquire, cost to serve, uh, referrals, word of mouth, revenue growth, downsell, upsell, churn, and all of those, you know, they do, right? That is the equation of customer experience. But until then, you actually have to prove that out um, in order to get us to a place where we don't have to anymore. Okay, so this kind of leads nicely into my next question I have for you. So most of the people listening is like, it's targeted towards customer service leaders, heads of customer support and that kind of thing. And I think a lot of them know the value of, a lot of them have a lot of empathy for their customer, of course, because they're dealing with them every day, but struggle to sort of get the rest of the business to listen. What tips do you have for those kind of people who want to convey the value of customer insights, especially from the customer support department? Yeah, what advice can you give them? And I think you have kind of touched on a lot of those things, but why are customer insights important? How can they share that? with the rest of the business. Sure, yeah. And I've done a little bit of that in Eventbrite where actually a lot of our data, like 80% of what the insights that came out of my team really informed 80% of, of the product roadmap. And so a lot of the insights actually came from the customer support function because especially in companies that are product-based, say for a B2C company or Eventbrite where there's like a platform and your offering is actually online and it is its own like digital product, you find most of the issues or like the optimizations of customer experience through through the support function, right? Because that's where like people call in for help. That's where you can look at the drivers of customer experience and optimization, um, really showing. And again, I'll, I'll come back to like marrying that data of, hey, these are the CX drivers of support. Like you could go many different ways. If we don't fix this, this is the projection of, of cost, right? So we have to put more heads in, you know, within our department. We need to probably, you know, purchase a chatbot functionality or move to, you know, whatever else, which is going to cost this much. So this is one side of the equation, like, do we want to increase that cost? But also at the same time as if we don't fix A, B, and C, then how is that going to impact our product acquisition and our, our customer retention and so forth? And so marrying that data, like I invested a lot in the beginning of being able to marry survey data with support data, with voice of the customer through the employee data, right? So I think a lot of people overlook that type of data as well, because our frontline, like, you don't even need to reach out what you should. But you don't even at times need to reach out to a customer, which is more costly, right? Like you can like literally understand the customer experience through through your frontline employees and they'll be direct and they won't soften anything. They'll be really honest with you about like what needs to improve and what doesn't. And so being able to marry all that data and not kind of not only take it, not only use support interactions, but also paint the full story around the holistic customer experience and then really tie it to metrics that really matter for the company is extremely important. And Eventbrite, by the end of when I was there, we actually had people that worked at support as part of each de development phase of the product, serving as the voice of the customer inside. Yeah. And so like through prototype phase up to the testing and the end and measurement, we use CX measures as well as part of the success of the, of the product. But you know, that was a, a cultural shift of like really bringing in this, the support function front and foremost and utilizing not just the data, but the actual folks that we have there that really know what's going to work. And it's not like part of the product creation. Well, that kind of answered my next question as well, which was about like, we think as a company, customer support data is like a very big untapped source of customer insight. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. And it is a critical part of, of the customer journey as well. And so like when we, with ServiceNow, we also measure customer support. Like we, we have a support survey that goes out right after those interactions. We utilize that data to make decisions as well. And it's part of that entire customer journey. And, and it is critical to, to success as well. So you need to be able to, to tap into that data to, write, to have the right analytics functionality as well. So what, you know, a lot of our support data is for Baden. So do you have a text analytics and a sentiment analysis tool that can surface that data in real time in analytics? Like I think in order to make any decision and to really impact change, it cannot wait. Like it cannot be like, I think it, back in the day, it was all of those offline analyses that take a quarter or two to produce. And then like kind of the experience is already 
moved on. Like we've already should have made that decision like two, three months ago, but it is the ability to harness all of that data from support or from your sales experience to your implementation, to your renewal experience, all of that data in a journey map that's real time that you could have leaders look at and see, okay, this is how we're doing here versus there. And this is kind of the customer journey, but being able to make those decisions real time. And then you could always have your quarterly reports or like your quarterly reviews with leaders to like really channel that information and those insights and, you know, kind of provide a holistic view, but being able to tap into that support data or into that, you know, sales data or six customer success data in real time is imperative. That for me is like so important. You should be able to see basically in real time, like this is happening. This problem is unfolding and be able to stop it in its tracks before it becomes like a pain point. Exactly. And there's like the good thing with, for example, with support, if we're just talking about this, is there's such a high volume of data, right? Because, you know, depending on the business, of course, but like usually there's a ton of interactions, right? And you have customers, like they, they call into support and need help. And so with that type of data, like you have a lot of tools out there where you could look at emerging trends, right? Like we would actually utilize some of that in my previous work where there's a whole new theme, like we would understand that something's wrong because like you'd have a text analytics and a sentiment analysis tool that looks through all the support cases coming in and flags if there's a completely new emerging topic that you have not heard of. So then in that moment, you could take action right away. And it's like, oh my God, you know, our chat bot stopped working or that page in our, in our, in our product is offline and there's tons of calls or like people are not getting, you know, the, their purchase transactions through and so forth. And it's like a way to really in real time fix an issue and kind of understand an issue um, and flag it for the organization. And that's, that also is the beauty of support because like with, I work in B2B now, and a lot of times we have trouble of getting a lot of high volume of data because it takes a while for a survey and we don't, you know, it's B2B customers. So it's not this massive amount of constituencies. Wow. With support, you could actually really utilize that uh, as a compass of how the organization is doing and really quickly zone in on a new issue that's emerging. Definitely, definitely, definitely. We do that, by the way, like the real-time text analytics stuff for support data. Um, I know what you're talking about. So this, I don't know if this is like a controversial question, but like we talked briefly about MPS. You've also talked about some of the downsides of surveys. Do you think support data can just replace surveys altogether? Do we still need surveys? That's a great question. So when I talk about listening to customers, I intentionally use the word listening posts versus just surveys. I think surveys are just part of the picture. I think the good things about surveys is that they're more targeted and gives you you know, specific data that you need in the moment that you need it. Um, but you should never only rely on that, right? Like there's many different channels that you need to tap in from the customers and your employees in order to provide a holistic picture and have enough insight across the journey to really make the decisions that are right. And so we don't really we rely only on surveys. To your point, we, we utilize support data a lot. We look at interviews, focus groups, customer advisory bo boards, product advisory boards. There's many, many different ways that you could inform a, a customer's journey or understand what's breaking and what isn't. So I'm not a, a huge proponent of relying only on one method that can get you there. I don't think one method is, is enough and doesn't give you that full perspective, um, but it can get you close to, to what you need. And then you could apply others. Like a lot of times we marry survey or support data, for example, with a deep dive on root cause and interviews after, right? So there, there's ways that they could work together. In an NPS, it's, it's just the metric, right? I think it's a lot of companies rile around it and rightfully so, right? Because it is a way to get that insight. I'm personally less concerned about the actual metric and more so about what insights we get out of it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. We like blasted through my four questions. Is there anything that you think more people need to know about in customer experience, like in the analytics space in particular? Is there anything else that I should have asked that I haven't yet? Uh, yeah, I think what is important with, with customer experience analytics functions is is democratization of, of customer feedback. I think that is key. And a lot of times where what I see is CX functions kind of hold the data in and then they only share it at a specific time. And so you don't have that leadership engagement or company-wide engagement with customer feedback. And that is critical. It's not just about the analytics and how, you know, how is this improvement in NPS going to drive this type of increase in revenue? It's more so about how are you building empathy and how are you enabling leaders with relevant data? And not just leaders, but anyone up from the front line up to the CEO. And having the tools to, to provide real-time dashboards or ways to have employees interact with customer feedback in real time, like on their mobile phone, having like really kind of reading through 
through like what Jeff said today about service now and our product, like really builds that empathy and understanding of the customer. Like I've I had instances where you'd make the most beautiful deck with, you know, all of the numbers that you'd imagine, but then you show a customer quote. And that completely changes the, the outlook of the leader that has to make a decision because it really brings that to life of, oh, wow, like, okay, like I can understand how that is a friction point or how this experience delights. And so being able to democratize customer feedback and make it relevant and role-based, right? You know, showing what's relevant to the right leader, to the right employee around customers is critical as when you're trying to drive a customer-centric culture versus putting this, all of that data in one silo. That's a really good point. Some people will like say, well, I everyone wants me to show them the numbers we need the data before we can trust any decisions but there is always that other side of it but you can bring it to life with the qualitative absolutely and like you should always use that like, there's never been like an insights project like that my team has done that doesn't have a quote and a lot of times to your point like those quotes are, are the you know really at the end that makes the decision right because that is the voice of the customer and you could get it many different ways like it could be a video of a customer speaking it could be listening into support interactions like one thing that we used to do at eventbrite was anyone from the company on a Wednesday can join in live to listen to, you know, the voice of the customer through like our agents where you could listen in of like, what are people calling about? And what are they saying? We'll record these sessions and kind of have a debrief afterwards of like, how did it go? Or, Hey, this is actually a critical pain point. And we have that same call about that one issue every single day. And then once you kind of start realizing that and really listening to the customer, really listening, right? Like you're not just looking at a deck. I think magic happens. Right, like where you can really one interaction show all of the issues across the board. Sometimes it does take to experience it yourself to really understand a point in general. So if you can listen to a support conversation, that's amazing. And uh, I think you, you mentioned earlier, like the culture comes from the top. It's like getting the executives of the company to sit and listen to support as well. Exactly. And that should be actually part of their onboarding or it should be, it should be, you know, demanded or not just encouraged. Like it is like when you think about how do you create a customer centric function uh, or company, like each function needs to walk the walk, right? Like of customer centricity. So what does that mean? For example, for global talent, like are we hiring for customer centricity? Are we training around customer experience? Are we enabling uh, ways to listen to the customer? from the front line to the C-suite, right? And so is listening to support interactions part of your onboarding curriculum? And that's what you need to do for the first, I don't know, you know, first 30 days, you need to have listened to at least a couple of sessions for an hour. Like we, we used to do that back in November. And so like it, it, it is like something that like from the get-go, you kind of understand, okay, like we really care about the customer. First of all, it shows you what the company is all about, but then it really puts you in the shoes of the customers from the start. And so every decision that you make afterwards is going to be based and founded on what you heard before from our customers. Yeah, that's that's so interesting. Would everyone do that? Every like everybody, even like people who are never gonna be near the customer. Absolutely. I mean like mm -hmm even functions like finance or legal or like functions like that, that like they're, you don't really see the direct impact to the customers. Still every decision that they make should be from the customer lens. And like at the end of the day, you know, customer experience is the new battlefield, right? Like of that companies really compete on. It used to be brand right back in the day when we didn't have social media and like information, digital transformation, where you'd rely on, oh, like, you know, that brand is amazing. That's the way I buy from always. But now it's, you have one bad customer experience experience and then you're, you know, there's so many other competitors out there across the board for anything really that why should you stick with that? Everyone needs to understand that customer experience at, is at the forefront and there should, every decision should be based on that. Even if, if it's, you know, in a department that's not customer facing. Wow. Cool. I love that. I can finish there. That's such a good point. Thank you so much. It's been great talking to you. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for having me. This has been great.